So far away, Lucas, uh, tell me one of your favourite moments from Always Sunny in Philadelphia, so we can put a clip in before we start. Um, maybe it's just Danny DeVito's song about not diddling kids. <laughs> it's so good. Ooh, I wouldn't do it with anybody younger than my daughter. No, little kids gotta be big, older than my wife, younger than my daughter, something like that. Don't write a song about that. No. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia is a difficult show to describe because it's basically spent the last decade or so it's been on the air, Sparta kicking every taboo over what would normally be considered the line in regards to comedy. Like, so just think of oh, It's Always Sunny as like Family Guy, if Family Guy had the balls to actually stand by any point being made or make a nuanced or original observation. Do you think he's fair, right? I mean, yeah, episode one starts with, like, the gang gets racist, and, the, you know, the whole premise of the show is, like, dealing with taboo topics, and the, the point is these are all awful people and examining a group of awful people through, uh, you know, a nuanced lens. Yeah, and one thing I'll say about It's Always Sunny is that they, like, never back down from the point being made. They make jokes about some of the taboo topics that they address, but mm -hmm. they don't use them superficially. They actually, you know, fully delve into... And the topics being handled. And then you compare it to something like Family Guy, where they use taboo topics as the punchline for a joke, but don't explore what that means. Generally speaking, Always Sunny doesn't punch down at, you know, nope. any demographic. And the only times that someone on the show does punch down, it's yeah, generally like, it. yeah, they're called out and like it's seen as a bad thing and shown as a bad thing. And Cade McDog is kicking off. You know what, K degrees. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> curiously, despite It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia being one of the most critically louded and successful shows on television at the moment, the pilot was filmed for about $100. So how much about this story do you know, Lucas, as a fan of the series? So far away, Lucas, I'm assuming as a fan of It's Always Sunny that you are keenly aware of what I'm talking about here. Uh, for the most part, I would assume so. Like, I've, you know, watched the the series many a time and listen to a lot of behind the, mm. the scenes stuff. It's helpful when they've got an entire podcast dedicated to talking about the behind the scenes stuff. Yes, um, uh, so I'm guessing you know all about uh, the ill-fated and never seen pilot for It's Always Sunny. Where it wasn't called It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, it was called something like It's Always Sunny in Los Angeles or something, wasn't it? I believe so, yeah. And like, they've they were initially meant to like be all you know struggling actors with like no money because at the time guess what they were all struggling actors in LA with no money so we can explain briefly if people aren't familiar with what we're talking about the always sunny in Philadelphia started life as a pilot called it's always sunny in Los Angeles or something like that mm -hmm. and uh, the idea was for the three principal creators Charlie Day and I always get his name wrong Rob McElhenney mm -hmm. yeah and Glenn Howerton were all going to play characters named after themselves. And this pilot was simply titled Charlie Gets Cancer. And the premise of that episode was that uh, they were going to pretend that Charlie's character had cancer so they could secure a role. And that is like a very, like, always sunny in Philadelphia plotline. And so much so, they reused the idea um, for the first season of the show where they made um, Charlie Gets Cancer, but the, like, the end the episode is different, although I believe the intro is exactly the same. Right, okay, yeah. I know that there's a bit of a blending of, like, a couple of um, ideas from that pilot get split off into, like, their own episodes, like Charlie Gets Cancer. And then they yes. also, like, bring that idea back where Charlie's mum in a later season also pretends to have cancer, and then Charlie's like, why would you do this? This is an awful thing. And she's like, well, I learned that one from you. <laughs> And it's like, oh yeah, I completely forgot about that. Um, but yeah, like as I mentioned, this ill-fated pilot um, was made by the three principal creators of It's Always Sunny um, uh, for about $100. And, and the exact amount of money it costs to make that pilot isn't really clear because it, that, the figure changes based on which interview you look at and with which member of the cast. Um, however, there is no interview that I could find where they've ever claimed it cost more than $200. Right. Would you like to hazard a guess at where that $200 went? Was it just on the camera? Uh, it wasn't the camera, it was the tapes for the camera. Oh, okay, yeah, because I, so, I vaguely remember them saying, like, they just had this, like, shitty handheld camera that they used. And there's probably someone out there thinking, hang on, I've seen clips of this so-called pilot. You said it's never been released. And I should mention that there are clips of the pilot out there. Mm -hmm. Here's one, for example. Jesus, dude, I thought my place looked like shit. Oh, yeah, sorry. Did you have a party or something? I mean, you, you seem like you're a little hungover or some shit. No, it's I found out that I might have cancer. 
However, the full episode they recorded has never seen the light of day and there are constant calls them to release it's like a DVD extra or something like that. But uh, my best guess is uh, based on, you know, our experience dealing with old footage, I would bet that that footage is just gone or been deleted or is on a hard drive in someone's house and they don't know where it is. Um, literally, like, I think it was yesterday or the day before as of recording, they had um, David Hornsby who plays Rickety Cricket. They mm -hmm. had him as, like, you know, one of the guests and talked about him on the show and stuff and they joked about all of these pilots that they've got just that they just haven't put out there and that people would probably find interesting it's like put them out then well that's the thing is i, I imagine like, in regards to the content we make there is so much stuff behind the scenes we've never released mm. because it's either been lost not been edited or we don't think it'd be interesting enough to enough people yeah uh, because we imagine that there's a lot of fans out there who'd want to see everything we've ever recorded like we often get asked why can't you just release completely uncut raw versions of the original recordings that you do it's like well we imagine a percentage of our audience will be interested in them but not enough to make it profitable so lucas you as I mentioned you're familiar with the pilot so are you aware of any other differences between the, the pilot and the final product and why you ever think i'll re-clarify them for the audience at home and like one is that it was set in la and mm -hmm. um, the second one is that the gang um uh, instead of being perpetually out of work losers uh, were struggling actors mm -hmm. which now i think about it is basically the same thing yeah. <laughs> and do you remember the other very key difference? And it involves like um, a, a very um, a prominent member of the cast not being present. Yeah, there's no uh, Caitlin Olsen. There's no Sweet there's D. There's no Caitlin Olsen. Su Sweet D is in the show. Yeah, Sweet but it's D like a very flat character, right? Curiously enough, um, Sweet D in the pilot was played by Rob McElhenney's girlfriend at the time. And they broke up and um, they left the show. And then Caitlin Olsen joined the cast. And then Rob McElhenney started dating Caitlin Olsen. <laughs> Which is such a weird say, dynamic, considering, like, the entire show is just Mac and the other members of the gang just berating Dee for being, like, the ugly bird. Yes, and uh, I will give massive props to Caitlin Olsen for um, when the show was first being made. As you mentioned, Sweet Dee was a very flat character, supposed to be the voice of reason. Mm -hmm. And when Caitlin Olsen joined the cast, she's like, I don't want to be the voice of reason. I want to be an arsehole too. Let me get in on the schemes. You never see female characters in shows like this being arseholes. That'll be funny. We can use that. Like, 100% props to her for just sticking her foot down, like, because she does it so well. She is an amazing physical comedian. Mm -hmm. And just, like, her eyes. Do you know she does the crazy eyes? <laughs> when she gets really mad, she's like, what the fuck? Like, what, was it the episode they got to the pool? And it's like, you know, da uh, Danny DeVito has got the AIDS blood. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> she's in the pool, like, oh, i got AIDS blood in my mouth. Is that blood? There's AIDS blood in the pool. It's got the AIDS blood. <laughs> and this is really difficult it's to describe why that's what you have to just go watch the episode to get the context if you don't get it because that sounds like weird there's no way to describe the show that doesn't make it sound like this nightmarish um uh, just fever dream but trust me the episode is fucking great and caitlin olsen is fantastic in near enough every episode she's in and it's something that i have to like really really just warn people about because like Every time I've recommended the show to people and they've come back, I mean, yeah, I did watch some of that, but like, I didn't really like any of them. I'm like, that's the point. The point yeah, is that they're all like that. assholes that you hate. And like, I think the best example of that is, like, weirdly enough, the episode that got taken down is the one with the blackface in it. Mm. Where the whole point of the episode where they do the blackface is that it's not good at all. And they have one of the characters try and argue, like, well, no, I'm not, you know, being offensive. I'm, you know, trying to portray a black person as accurately as possible, which is the same kind of argument someone would make in real life. But when it's coming out of the mouth of someone on It's Always Sunny and they're supposed to be horrible, that's the point. You're supposed to be like, wow, that is a stupid argument. It's so stupid that Rob McElhenney's character on Always Sunny would make it. Like, if it's an argument Mac would make, it's not a good argument for doing this thing. Yeah, that's the thing. It's literally like um, Mac and Frank sitting there being like, no, but, like, blackface is fine. And it's, oh, okay, yeah. So this is just, you know, the entire conversation is a breakdown of, like, awful people arguing for blackface and therefore, you know, trying to essentially argue against blackface by having that character say that it's yeah. good. But it's just like, no, take it down. And you have to because people too stupid to realise that mm -hmm. are going to use it as an example. Like, what's the example me and you, Lucas, get really annoyed about every time this gets brought up? What's a film that people always bring up of like, oh, you couldn't make that today? 
with Robert Downey Jr. Oh, Tropic Thunder, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but every time this topic comes up, someone goes, well, what about Tropic Thunder? And it's like, that's the point. The point of Tropic Thunder is that Robert Downey Jr.'s character is an actor who's so caught sure of their own acting ability, they think they can play blackface. The joke is, is that they think that they can get away with it. And every other person in the film is like, this is not okay. Yeah, everybody in that entire movie is constantly being like, this was not an okay move. This is not a good thing. Like, you shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a meta commentary on actors who think that um, they should be able to, like, you know, play roles um, uh, that should, you know, realistically have gone to members of that ethnicity. I, I guess there's that viewpoint of, like, regardless of whether it's to be done in a meta way, blackface is still not a thing to be done. So I can, course, I can yeah. understand why, like, people have issues with it regardless. Like, I'm not advocating for it even in that sense no. of, like, trying to use it to break down the use of it is still using it. Yeah, and as we talked about, um, it's often misunderstood by fucking morons who can't read media, mm -hmm. who just see that it's there, read it on the most superficial level imaginable, and go, why is that okay? And it's like, well, if you're too stupid to watch the film and see the message being made, there's no point having this conversation. Yeah. It's like, if you don't understand why the film is making a point about this thing, was probably not a point of having a conversation. But anyway, bringing it back to It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Um, the show's pilot was filmed between, for anywhere between like $100 and $200. And have you like ever heard the story of how the show um, made it onto FX? Um, I might have done, but like it, it, I don't remember whether I have or not. Well, it was a stroke of remarkable good fortune mm. um, uh, for the gang. Um, in that, at the exact moment, um, Rob McElhenney pitched It's Always Sunny, saying that they were able to film the pilot for about $100. And the executive producer at FX that they met had just been instructed by higher-ups, you need to find some really, really cheap comedy shows that we can use to fill out our um, uh, roster. So on the day they went in for the meeting to pitch It's Always Sunny, uh, the executive they met had been told, find a cheap comedy show that we can make for next to nothing. And then on that day, a guy walks in and goes, I've got a pilot here that costs $100. So at that point, you might as well just give them a season and see just what see, happens yeah. because they can make it for almost that cheap. Obviously, they they had to like get a bar set and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. if they, they turn around and say that they can do something even close to that per episode, it's like, yeah, cool. Yeah, do it. Well, like, you know, chuck them like, you know, 20, 30 grand just to get a couple episodes out to see what happens. And that's what they did. Mm -hmm. And um, as a result of the show costing so little to make, Rob McElhenney was able to argue the complete and total creative control over the tone and direction of the show. Mm -hmm. Something that is virtually unheard of with TV shows, and especially TV shows that are brand new with unproven, um, unknown actors and directors and writers. Yeah, and the actors and have what... been very open because all three of the main actors are also, you know, um, writers as well as other writers that they eventually got in uh, for the writers room mm -hmm. and stuff but they've always really praised FX for giving them just like anything they ask for essentially like they just yep. do whatever they want and FX are like yeah sure like go for it because this show is clearly like great. Up to and including Danny fucking DeVito because the story goes that and um, the same executive they met with who greenlit the show um, uh, was like you know kind of happy with how it was going but thought that it needed some star power mm -hmm. to bring more people in and he happened to know Danny DeVito. And he asked Danny DeVito if he wanted to be on a few um, episodes of the show. And Danny DeVito was more than happy to do it, but I think he had like 20 or so days of filming available, and that was it. So what they did is they thought, fuck it, let's put Danny DeVito in every single episode. Mm -hmm. And we're going to film every episode of season two, of the scenes that involve Danny DeVito, in those 20 days. That sounds nightmarish to film, like, all 10 episodes partially at once. Yep, so every scene with Danny DeVito when it was filmed in those 20 days to accommodate his schedule to make sure he was in every single episode. Mm -hmm. And then the story goes that um, while the show didn't do fantastic, there was a great quote from uh, um, a reviewer um, about the first season where the show is not as smart as it thinks it is. And it's like 14 seasons later and it's got like 15 fucking Emmys and it's winning all kinds of fun. It's <laughs> um, now uh, like critical... the longest running live action sitcom in the world. Yeah, but um, the story of that early success of the show was attributed to Hulu, where it became like just this cult hit on Hulu. Mm -hmm. Because people were like, have you seen this show? It's always sunny. It's like, no, it's like, you need to watch It's Always Sunny. And those numbers yeah. were so good that it encouraged FX to um, give them more money for the next season and bring in Danny DeVito. I'm really surprised it as well, because like, I think even, you know, myself as like someone who's been watching it for a long time now, like, 
Yeah. I, I was still like five, six seasons late. There's so many people that started watching when the show must have been like five, six, seven, eight, nine seasons in. Yeah. It's like, God, I'm surprised they managed to uh, hold out for that long. They did, and it's just done. Like, you know, it's only gone from strength to strength since then. Mm -hmm. And it's partly a result of the fact that just three struggling actors agreed to make the pilot for the cost of about six tapes. Good on them. So Far Away Lucas, a topic that we have discussed on the channel occasionally is the idea of offensive humour. And uh, something you mentioned during the recording of this video, I'm not sure if it's going to go in or not, is uh, that It's Always Sunny um, makes extensive use of taboo topics, offensive humour, things that people might find uncouth, but it never really punches down, mm -hmm. except for when it is highlighting how awful its characters are and the position that they're held. And uh, I think that's one of the strengths of the show. And it's always baffled me that people can watch something like It's Always Sunny and then compare it to other lesser shows where they just use like minorities and um, other groups as the punching bag mm -hmm. rather than using those topics as a platform to discuss things, you know, raise a wider issue and draw attention to something as comedy should be used. Yeah. And are there any moments in It's Always Sunny that you think are particularly well handled in that regard? It, it's hard to like pick out certain moments because... Like, they're not necessarily, you know... I mean, I'm sure there's some examples over the, like, 16 seasons that I'm not thinking of at the mm -hmm. moment, but, like, there's not many moments where it's really highlighted of the fact that they're not punching down. It's hard to really have yeah. those moments when, essentially, they are the bottom of the barrel and you can't get lower than that. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, any time they try, it's kind of already glossed over because no one's taken them very seriously. We, and we mentioned, no, that's kind of the point. Of like, these horrible people have horrible opinions and the expectation is that you're able to put two and two together in your head and think, well, only these horrible opinions are held by people as bad as this. Mm -hmm. And then people seemingly don't get that. And, uh, like, you know, we mentioned the episode where they go to the water park of, like, you know, just pretending to have a, a deadly communicable illness. To just um, get, to get to the, to the front, front of the water the line. Park. <laughs> And I'm guessing there's a bunch of those weird edgy guys out there who watch that and just laugh at it because they say the word AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, like there is a bit more there than just the characters screaming AIDS. It's supposed to, like, you know, an example of the selfishness of people when they're not getting what they want, or how people are willing to like co-opt illnesses and um, like you know um, all manner of uh, horrible ailments for their own ends. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like the the impetus of that decision is because. Um, Charlie and Frank are waiting in a queue and want to hit every single, um, you know, water park ride in one day. Mm. But they say, like, oh, it's going to be nearly impossible. And then they see a kid that has leukemia get pushed to the front of the line. And they're like, oh, okay. The first instinct isn't to go, oh, you know, like, that's fair enough. A, a kid with leukemia, you know, they, they, they can go to the front of the line. We're not going to be mad at it. It's like, no, fuck that child. I want to get to the front instead. Yeah, and you can see that in real life. Now, how often have you, like, you know, not in this extreme a way, mm -hmm. but how often do you see people in real life notice somebody else getting not even a massive advantage over them? It's like, you know, the crumb. Just a crumb more than they do because their lot in life is way shittier than theirs. And their response isn't, you know, like, well done then. Like, good on them or what have you. It's like, no, where's mine? Simplest example is parking spaces, like disabled parking spaces. Like, how yep. many people abuse them or get mad that they're there for other people? Or, like, mother and child spaces mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. Of like, why can't I park at the front? I ain't got kids. Like, why do they get to park at the front just because they've got kids? It's like, have you ever tried getting a kid out of car and walk to a car park mm -hmm. with a kid? <laughs> it's like, and it's just that thing of they have no empathy for other people. And that's one of the great things about the show where it highlights um, in a very extreme and comedic way um, that line of reasoning that um, horrible people have. Yeah, and then I think, like, they do a really good job as well of balancing how horrible it can be because, you know, one um, example is the episode where they talk about what should they put on the doors of the toilets because they, you know, yes. trying to talk about whether, like, single-gender toilets are correct or not. And then they mm -hmm. have, like, a lot of different arguments in, like, again, framed in this way of them being awful people or, like, strange people. Like, you know, they it turns out, like, Charlie needs to go into the women's toilets to get into a dress because mm -hmm. that's what his mum did to get him into like toilets when they were kids is dress him up like a girl so that she could take him into the girls toilets 
so that she could look after him and it's like then that's carried on until his adult life but then the entire you know thing is very strange but they just resolve the entire situation by like just labeling the toilet animal shit house and leaving it there yeah and it's like you know they pretty much hit the nail on the head in that regard of why do we care mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> and it's like when the like the worst people like fiction can conjure up don't give a shit about this issue it's kind of the message there like you shouldn't care either if like these people who are like abjectly awful in near enough every single regard don't care about the issue of um, gender toilets you shouldn't care either yeah because the entire breakdown is like at the end of the day we've all got some weird quirks and we all feel a bit shamed about pooping and we're all just animals in that sense and fuck it anyone can just use any toilet because we're just we're just there to dump our shame and leave and that's something that's what i mean about them actually like you know having something to say about the issue exactly. rather than yeah. using the issue itself as the joke mm-hmm. And that's what I think is the strength of Always Sunny is one of the reasons I look forward to it continuing uh, for as long as the creators continue giving enough of a shit to keep making it. Which is another thing I respect about them. Like, when are you going to stop making it? It's Always Sunny. When it stops being fun. 